Alors, bonjour et bienvenue à toutes et tous. Nous voilà maintenant à la deuxième journée et dernière journée du colloque sur la, les organisations internationales en transformation. Hier, il y avait déjà une première partie où un certain consensus, en fait, a émergé qu'il s'agit plus d'envisager des options de réforme, moins de jeter à terre et de créer de nouvelles organisations. Nous avons aussi vu que les organisations internationales sont tributaires des climats politiques évolutifs qui peuvent être plus ou moins favorables aux organisations internationales. Et nous avons aussi vu que la science est vraiment un outil essentiel dans les relations internationales. D'une part, pour comprendre, expliquer et explorer des années de réforme, et d'autre part aussi comme outil de diplomatie et de lien finalement entre les États et les acteurs. Aujourd'hui, nous allons poursuivre avec deux nouveaux ateliers. Il y aura aussi une période de réflexion avec Mme Louise Arbeau et une synthèse. Donc, les deux ateliers, même formule que, que hier, une grande conférence qui débute l'atelier et ensuite un groupe de discussion avec trois experts. Je vous rappelle que lors des, euh, des présentations, tout au long en fait de l'événement, vous pouvez cliquer sur votre bouton qui est en bas de votre écran et les questions et réponses pour poser vos questions qui seront colligés par notre équipe et posés euh, finalement en direct euh, à la suite des, euh, des conférences. Toutefois, si on n'a pas le temps de poser toutes les questions, on les garde bien précieusement là, pour alimenter nos réflexions dans la suite de l'événement. Alors, sans plus attendre, pour le premier atelier, juste vous mentionner qui sera, qui est pour thème la collaboration internationale et les objectifs de développement durable. Je vous rappelle que la conférence principale sera en anglais, mais vous aurez vraiment la possibilité de poser vos questions tant en français, en anglais, elles seront traduites par notre équipe. Alors, uh, to start, we have, uh, the, we are very thrilled and honored to have uh, Shekhar Saxena, a professor of the practice of global mental health at the Department of Global Health and Population at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. He's a psychiatrist by training. He has served in the WHO since 1998. And from 2010 to 2018, he was the director of the Department of Mental Health and Substance Abuse at the WHO. So the title of his talk is WHO Redefining Its Role in a Rapidly Changing World, certainly a very timely and relevant topic. So we are really looking forward to hearing you, Professor Saxena, and you have 15 minutes. So the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Agis, and, uh, and a good morning to all of you. And I do apologize for speaking in English, which uh, is my limitation, but I hope that uh, some of the messages will be clear and I will be very happy to discuss it further. Uh, I did spend a lot of time in WHO, so I have a slight bias in putting WHO in a better light than perhaps most of you will agree with. But uh, that's my opinion, and I'm not representing WHO here because I do not any longer work for WHO, but I do have some insights which I do want to share with you. So I'll begin my presentation. I have a PowerPoint which I will show, and uh, uh, I hope you can see the PowerPoint now. This is the first slide. Yes. Okay. So uh, the topic that I want to discuss today, the World Health Organization, and uh, more importantly, redefining its role in a rapidly changing world. And uh, that's what uh, I believe is quite important at this point of time. The contents of my initial speech will be in five bullet points. One is introduction to WHO. I think a lot of you will know WHO, but I'll just uh, make an introduction for some of the others who may not know it that well. I will then describe two areas of WHO's activities. One, which is a very major activity right now, which is responding to the COVID-19 pandemic. And the second, uh, which is less known, but uh, it's in the area of mental health, which uh, I was part of when I was working for WHO, so I know that uh, well. And these are just two examples of the kind of activities that which WHO does. And then I'll go on to WHO strengths and weaknesses. And finally, I'll spend a few minutes on the, on the changing world and try to answer the world, the question, will WHO change as well and to what extent? This is the WHO building, main building in, in Geneva as the headquarters. 
I spent 20 years of my life working in this building. I like it. It's an old building, but a nice one. And these are the several offices that WHO has. Its headquarters is in Geneva, uh, but it has six regional offices for the North America. The office is in Washington, but there are offices in Copenhagen, in Cairo, in Brazzaville in Africa, in New Delhi, and in Manila. Besides that, there are 150 country offices. In most of the low and middle income countries, there is an office. And so it is a global organization and it's a very large organization with presence in, in all over the world. Uh, the governance of WHO, which is quite important, uh, which I will pick up later on, is like this. It has an executive board and it has a World Health Assembly. These are the two governing bodies of WHO. Executive board is consist of a smaller number of countries. And the World Health Assembly consists of all the 194 member states. And uh, it is held in May every year. And all ministers of health of the individual member states attend that assembly. Uh, of course, uh, the last assembly in 2020 was uh, by remote means. And actually, currently, this day, the executive board is meeting again remotely. And so the, that are the governing bodies. The member states are 194, and each have one vote, which is quite important to note that richer countries have at least no constitutional power over WHO, which is larger than the smaller countries or the poorer countries. They all have a single vote. The director general is elected by member states. It is an election and not a selection. So obviously, countries put up candidates and they finally vote on the on the member states. So it is quite, uh, quite a political process that is followed within WHO. But what is quite important to note is also that the regional directors are independently elected. That means there is a DG for the whole world. And then there are six regional directors for each of the regional offices, which are independently elected. And that really is one of the issues that is quite important for the governance because regional directors report to their region's countries and the DG reports to all countries, which creates a very unique situation, which has impact on the response the WHO has. The current director general is Dr. Tedros, uh, generally known as Dr. Tedros, and I'm sure most of you would have seen him on the TV because he's giving a media briefing almost every day. So he is now becoming suddenly from a nobody to a very well-known figure all over the world, which also is true for WHO. From an from a obscure organization, suddenly it has become an organization known by practically everybody who watches the TV or listens to the radio. Let me quickly go through the core functions of WHO, which are six. And these are essentially uh, functions that WHO has done for the last 70 years of its existence and continues to do. The most important one actually is providing leadership on matters critical to health and engaging in partnerships but it also does research, so it shapes the research agenda. WHO does not do much of research by itself, but it does shape the agenda and is a user for research. It also sets norms and standards. For example, WHO makes the international classification of diseases, which is followed all over the world for reporting diseases. It actually named the, the COVID virus and the COVID disease which nobody else can do. It's only WHO who has a mandate to do that. It also articulates ethical and evidence-based policy options. So the primary function of WHO is to tell governments how they should form and implement health policies, which is equally true for richer countries versus poorer countries. So it is the, the, the technical agency advising all governments on policy options. It also provides technical support, which is much more to the less uh, rich countries. And because richer countries have their own technical expertise like Canada. And so it is less important, but from time to time, and especially during the COVID period, 
it is providing technical support to all countries, which is worthwhile to note. And finally, but quite importantly, it monitors the health situation like a mirror in front of the world as to how you're doing on health and what more you should be doing. So these are some of the core functions of, uh, of WHO. And these are all well aligned with the sustainable development goals of the United Nations. The health is a part of the SDG 3, which is 13 targets, but health is of course impacted by all other SDGs. So it's directly involves WHO's work for all SDGs and for all its 196, uh, 197, uh, 167 targets. So it is in the area of health, but it does impact the policies on all other areas of development. Uh, in the recent years, WHO has taken a very ambitious agenda of influencing uh, by universal health coverage, 1 billion more people, 1 billion more people for better protection from health in terms of health emergencies, which includes COVID and 1 billion more people enjoying better health and well-being. So these are the very large scale objectives for this part of the plan for WHO. I rapidly moved to the WHO's global response to COVID, which has of course been uh, admired, but also criticized quite a bit in the, by the governments as well as by the public media. It did declare a public health emergency of international concern on 30th of uh, January last year going to be just one year from uh, from today uh, but it has been criticized for delaying it too much uh, when you remember that it has to have the global consensus and go by the evidence perhaps it was not that much of a delay but yes it could have done something earlier it is uh, at this point of time all through the year it is collecting and providing latest data on infections and death every day it is collecting that and providing it is providing guidance on public health and clinical response. Mind you, these are both guidance on public health issues about policies, but also about clinical response. What drug should be used? What drug is used less? How to arrange for more uh, ventilators and all of that. It is also coordinating global effort on research and vaccine supply, for example. It coordinated the solidarity trials for drugs and it is all, it's, uh, it's still coordinating the access to vaccine, vaccines, especially for those parts of the world which are uh, less covered by its COVAX uh, initiative. Uh, I cannot but mention that Canada is one of those countries which has uh, already collected a very large number of vaccines. Perhaps it covers five times the population of Canada which is at the expense of many other countries which do not have enough vaccines. So that is an issue which WHO is trying to tackle. How can vaccine access be equitable? It's not whoever can buy at the highest price. It should be whoever needs it more. And that is the function of WHO, which no other government is able to do at a global basis. It also provides a specific technical assistance to countries and it provides media briefings, as many of you might have seen, in correcting misinformation because there is a lot of misinformation around COVID and it corrects that. So the questions that are being debated, and they're all good questions. Was the response timely? Was it too late? Is the response adequate? Perhaps not enough. Is the response unbiased? Was it favoring China versus other countries? There can be two opinions about that but uh, that's a question that one can validly ask. And is the response effective? And my answer to the last question, is the response effective? Is that within the capacity of WHO, it is doing what it can, but obviously much more is necessary and was necessary. So is it effective? Yes. It is. Is it adequate? Perhaps not. I go on to uh, the other questions. Did the countries follow WHO guidance? Because WHO can provide guidance, but it has no power to force countries to follow its guidance. And perhaps the answer is uh, a very large number of countries did not follow the WHO guidance in a timely and adequate manner. 
and the reasons are various variable context within the countries lack of resources within countries inadequate credibility of who which could be improved and of course political considerations whether the us administration follows who's guidance or not was very clear in the last one year time and similarly in many other countries there were many political considerations i quickly go on to a smaller area than covid mental health and substance abuse who has taken a lead in the last 10 years or so in really taking a leadership role in global attempts to improve mental health and to decrease the harmful use of substances it initiated the global strategy on the harmful effects of alcohol in 2010 which is one of its kind in reducing the problems because of alcohol and i know canada is very faithfully following some of the advice of who it started the mental health action plan in 2013 first plan and i know that canada's mental health plan is a very good example of how these things could be done at a national level and it's being renewed in 2021 this year it also uh, took an active part in un general assembly special session on drugs in 2016 and it has a special initiative on mental health uh, initiated last year which are all uh, geared towards giving the importance to mental health and substance abuse which uh, the world needs but it is not doing it so that's the kind of work who does in advocacy in technical assistance in in, in global coordination which is very useful i come to the last part of my presentation which is what are who's strengths what are its weaknesses and how it is changing and how it should change is the only un agency with with a full mandate on health so there is there is a very unique position of who within the international organizations in the area of health which nobody else can have and and will have it is supposed to be neutral to what extent one can debate it is definitely neutral from commercial consideration so no company or no big tech or or no other vested interest has a, a say in who's functioning which is very good whether it is neutral between countries is something that can be debated and obviously uh, each country has one vote but some countries do have more power than many other countries almost all countries are members which is a very good strength and as of yesterday usa is joining which is very good news its technical expertise is well recognized and respected which is which is a very good thing uh, there are many country national uh, organizations which are also technically very good including in canada but who's global expertise is something that no other national organization can mimic so it has a very unique technical expertise its reach is global as i explained earlier and is unparalleled its convening power is unique it, it convenes a lot of technical groups and it gets the best of the people to advise for it and it covers all areas of health because there are many agencies which are national which are in in a particular area of health but who covers all area of, uh, of health which is its major strength obviously who is not perfect it has many weaknesses and limitations one of the major limitations from the governance viewpoint is that it serves its masters which is which is a very tricky situation to be in the member states countries are its governing board and who serves the governing board so there is a inherent tension between what the countries would like to do versus what the countries should do and that's a big problem and it is apparent even in the covid field it is a technical agency but is governed politically so that is again an issue it cannot be unbiased from political considerations and also there is the issue of hq versus regions which i uh, referred to earlier there are now a number of other international agencies in the area of health for example the world bank or large foundations like gates and other foundations which uh, have a much larger amount of money so it, they have power 
And, and so there is an inherent tension between the leadership of WHO and the leadership of some of these other agencies. WHO's funds are very limited, less than $3 billion per year, which is a very small amount for the kind of work that WHO does, which is a major limitation. And it, the large majority of its funds are earmarked. So that is the limitation. And it also tries to do too many things. And perhaps some of the things it's not able to do well. My last slide, and I know that I'm uh, now at the time, COVID-19 has brought health security as the highest priority and WHO has received the unprecedented visibility simply because uh, a pandemic like COVID has actually affected our economic situation in a very big way. The whole world came to a standstill, all the economic activity go down. So, the world perhaps does not recognize the importance of health, but it does recognize the importance of economics. So that's what has really broadened the field. Has the image of WHO improved in the eyes of governments and general public? I would say overall, yes, and that's a good thing to do. Will WHO receive more funds? Doubtful. It should, but will it? Don't know. Can WHO prioritize its activities well? It will try and hopefully will succeed. And will WHO's governance, can, can it be improved? Yes. Will it be improved? I'm not so sure because it's the countries which govern it. So overall, I'm hopeful that WHO will do a good job, perhaps a better job. And let's see what suggestions we can make from the discussion on that. Thanks very much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Saxena. It's nice to have a bit of optimism uh, during these times, so that's welcome. Uh, thanks also for reminding us that despite all the criticism that WHO has faced, it's, it really plays a key role in uh, global health uh, governance. And also for reminding us that there is the issue of the WHO, but also the issue of states compliance. So it really is a dynamic between the two. It's not only a problem for WHO, but it really is the states who are responsible to some extent uh, uh, to make sure that global health governance uh, prioritize the, the right issues and really ensure that we allocate funds and precious resources based on, based on needs, for instance, and not uh, financial resources. So thank you very much for that. Um, I don't know if we have uh, questions uh, from uh, the audience. Uh, do you know, Stephanie? Otherwise, uh, I have a a quick question, if I can. Vas-y, Catherine, c'est tout ça pour ça. Okay, so um, two, uh, actually two brief uh, questions, but maybe uh, the answer is not <laughs> so uh, brief. Um, first, can you uh, expand a little bit more on the issue of compliance? Like, what are the key challenges that make states quite reluctant sometimes to really follow WHO's recommendations? and? There's a lot of political issues, economical issues, but if you can expand a little bit more on that, that would be wonderful, I think. And also just considering it's a hot topic right now, but uh, we have a new, gov the US has a new government uh, right now. And what do you expect from that government and their new relationship it will uh, build with WHO? Because it was uh, a tough four years for sure for uh, the interaction between the two. Thank you. Thank you very much. Both very important questions, and I'll try to answer briefly. Uh, the first question, what are the issues uh, around compliance? Uh, let's remember that WHO is, doesn't have a legal power over uh, member states and governments to enforce its guidance. It's, it's a persuasive power, but not a legal power. For example, there are many other uh, issues around which there is a legal power. Uh, the conventions that UN, uh, UN signs along with member states have a legal power. We can go to the court and challenge that. In WHO's functioning, it is not, apart from one exception, that is the tobacco treaty, which has a legal enforcement. But other than that, it has no legal power. So even if it says, please do that, countries can say yes, or countries can say no. The, the power comes from consensus. If, if all the ministers of health meet and decide that it is a good thing to do this, they usually follow, but not always. So that is the state in which WHO is, but perhaps that's part of the WHO's mandate. It, it is an advisory, 
it is not an enforcement agency which actually is limitation because during times like covid if some if there was an international organization which could actually enforce we would have seen much less number of deaths so it's unfortunate but that's the reality mm-hmm. uh the second question about the uh, usa i i see that by announcing the the president elect several months back already made his intentions clear that uh, usa will join rejoin who it actually never left so it's a matter of just a paper piece of paper to be signed and also that uh, usa will actively contribute to to who's functioning which is very good usa accounts for about 22% of the overall budget of who which is important but more so usa has the kind of technical expertise which helps the global activities so by not providing funds but also not providing technical part it would have been a big big loss and so i am very relieved uh, and i'm sure who will must be very relieved that uh, the administration has changed and things are on the right path i feel that some of the countries like usa can actually be a shining example in the area of health and unfortunately that is not the case usa has sustained the largest number of fatalities because of covid compared to many other countries which have much less money and technical expertise so this is a good or perhaps a very bad example of what usa could have done if it followed who's advice so i i feel a a, a much more positive future for usa's interaction with who like many other countries and a uh, much better progress on on health issues in the future well thank you very much again uh, professor saxena and it's all the time we have uh, for the question period right now but i hope you can stay with us and perhaps join the conversation again uh, later but i totally understand if you have to leave um thank so- you very much for inviting me i'll be uh, continuing to be part of it for some time and then i will need to leave but thank you again for letting me part of the discussion thank you